Hello everyone and welcome to Think Tech virtual meetups for the summer season. It is organized by Saudi Ministry of Communication and Information Technology. Think Tech is a digital environment created to separate a digital awareness about emerging te technology. This topic, we are happy to introduce you the series of meetup focus in emerging technology today. Our session is gaming educational pur purpose. So we have a meeting today and it is about a gaming that we use it to education. First, I would like to welcome my guests, Dan and Ahmed and Layla. And I would like to every one of my guests to introduce himself. So we will start with Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Dan, I'm the founder of GameFruit, uh, a platform for young people to learn about creative coding and game development and we mostly work with young people and get young people engaged and excited about learning through games uh, thank I'm, you dan yes ahmed I'm, start i'm ahmed al rashid uh, founder of uh, alab uh, it's uh, a media platform where we uh, post some uh, uh, entertainment videos uh, and uh, uh, and we also have uh, a gaming podcast that's both in, in audio and video. Um, and we also uh, review games. Uh, we're pretty much gaming media. Thank you, Ahmed. Nice to meet you, Ahmed and Dan. Uh, okay, and, we are, and now we have Leila. Leila, can you please introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, I'm a gamer and a game developer. I have, uh, I'm the founder of uh, Player One Studio. I'm also uh, a lecturer in Al Yamama University. I'm teaching game development alongside other uh, development courses. Yeah. Thank you, Leila, and nice to meet you. Uh, welcome to my guest, and welcome to our listening. Uh, so now we will start to to explain what is the means of the game education. So can you, Dan, please explain to us? And I want to hear it from all of you, from your view, what is the game education means? I can start. Uh, for me, uh, game, games, and edu ga games are a platform for learning on. Um, you know, for me, and probably for a lot of other adults out there, when we were at school, we were taught with a blackboard in front of us or a whiteboard maybe even a projector with acetate. Uh, but a lot of kids these days and their teachers are using uh, games as a platform where, you know, multiplayer platform like Minecraft or even World of Warcraft where a teacher can invite all of their students into this environment and they can uh, craft things together and learn together in a kind of digital um, an engaging environment. Um, kids in Minecraft are learning all kinds of things like physics and how to collaborate and share together. Um, it's really hard to summarize what kids are learning without it kind of sounding, um, uh, yeah, not, uh, it's a, such a vast subject that it's hard to kind of condense down, but. Um, are you mean I Minecraft? Think, yeah, and just game development and game platforms in general. Um, uh, I, I actually, I, I learned um, Minecraft edu for education. It's so for more fun. Like when you create a level for your student and they enter this level to solve this, like for mathematics or for any subject you want. Yeah. Um, I, I think it, it's a very special time in history where we, we're giving and providing 
learners an opportunity to, you know, learn something in these environments where they where they're choosing to engage, where they engage anyway. Um, I I don't think that's really ever been done before, and um, I think I think a educational experiences should uh, somewhat be at least equal to uh, a person's other digital experiences. So for me, gaming and education is all mm. about um, engagement and um, providing a familiar space to learn. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for your points. Um, now we want to hear from your Ahmed. What if everyone, everyone, if, if, Anyone ask you what does the game education means? How you would explain this for him? Well, to me, uh, educational games are uh, uh, games that are more focused on uh, educating uh, the users, or uh, make them, or uh, having the users learn, uh, uh, mainly learn more about uh, whatever subject they want to uh, educate, like. Uh, let's say math or, or chemistry or history. Um, and uh, from my experiences, uh, uh, educational games w weren't uh, really attractive enough for, uh, uh, for younger people and, uh, or students. And, uh, uh, and that, that created this, uh, this genre of educational games. Uh, which are the games that are more focused on education. But to me, I think all games could be educational because- I agree. Uh, yeah, because you learn and you gain experience through, uh, and you gain all different skills uh, while playing those games. Okay. Thank you, Ahmed. Leila? Uh, I do agree with what, uh, with what Ahmed said. Uh, uh, usually, um, playing is something useful in our lives. We played as children and even animals they play. And this is how they uh, strengthen their bodies, strengthening their minds and improving their skills. So it's not something new uh, to use uh, playing as a tool of training. Uh, it's just that um, we want to teach the children uh, a lot of skills, not just give them information. We want to teach them the to ability to search, the ability to think out of the box, to have critical thinking, uh, problem solving skills, task management, time management, etc. We can use or give them. Uh, we can give them the information on how to do this, but if they don't try it themselves, if they don't have a hands-on experience. Uh, we cannot say that we've given them the best uh, or we have used the best method uh, to teach them. And uh, games, unlike other media, uh, it provides the chance to do something in them. It's not just you're watching or hearing. You are doing something. So you learn by experience. And this is more powerful than any other method in teaching. Okay? Okay. Okay, thank you, Leila. Uh, so, is there any head hidden value in the game education? Uh, can you repeat that? Is any hidden value of the gaming of education in education? Actually, uh, can you be more specific? Um, hidden value. Yeah. The normal education or the regular education uh, normal educational games no the or education just... and the education in games is there's the value in education games more than the normal education oh um uh, i don't think uh, uh games or, or educational games at the state is much more valuable than the actual regular education or let's say the traditional way of education because uh, usually the the traditional way of education mm -hmm. has uh, has much more uh, information 
than what's uh, uh, what's presented in in games. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the purpose of having uh, you know education ed educational elements in games is to uh, ease the uh, the entry into uh, this uh, vast information that you want to present, or if you want to teach. Uh, especially younger uh, people to teach them uh, certain skills or 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 um, uh, or any information uh, in a way that's uh, that's uh, uh, more accessible than learning it in a traditional way where you read or write or type. Yeah. Thank you, Ahmed. What is, what about you, Dan? I think it um, offers different people who learn differently an opportunity to uh, learn better. I hope that makes sense. Uh, we sometimes work in, in New Zealand here, we um, describe young people with um, disabilities like autism um, as, or, or, or Asperger's or these um, as gifted and talented learners. So we've, we've, we've met young people who struggle to use pens and paper and um, the traditional learning um, where it's sort of failing them. So providing these particular young people with a platform like gaming um, or game development provides them with an opportunity to um, be like everybody else and learn what everybody else is learning. Um, and, and, you know, this was really made obvious to me a few months ago. We were running a workshop and we asked a group of these kids to write a game development document. And in the games industry, when you're making a game, quite often you'll write a game design document. And we pulled out the pens and paper and some of these kids just freaked out and they didn't want to do it and they weren't engaging. So providing digital platforms is really important and it levels the educational playing field. Um, we, we think so that's that's just one hidden value um, another might be that um, a lot of adults today who experienced an education uh, 10 20 years ago I think um, they probably aren't so familiar with the affordances of digital tech and gaming and I think need to give it a chance okay Thank you, Dan, for your points. Uh, Leila? Well, um, I don't, it depends on the, in, in what we are teaching. In, in, in some, in some co uh, topics or skills, we, uh, we have to use the traditional methods. Like when we're teaching them how to write using pen and, pe uh, pen and paper. Uh, however, there are other topics where we can have games not just to teach but also like what uh dan have said to motivate them to get them engaged uh i remember one of my friends was teaching um in kindergarten and she used she's a game developer she used to create simple games for her students and they they even they have enjoyed it while they are learning so when we motivate someone to learn it's like we're, we're um, basically, uh, it's more powerful than, uh, for example, forcing someone to learn. So when we give them the motivation, it's like, uh, it will make them want to do something. And wanting to do something is different from having to do something. So here is where games can help. It motivates. It makes them want to win, want to gain more points, want to uh, do it again because they are enjoying it. Okay. Thank you, Leila. So that means the, the education games is not only puzzle, puzzles and quizzes, right? So how, how to use the game in education without using puzzles and quizzes? Because the means of your points, that means we didn't use it the normal way, that puzzles and quizzes and uh, 
the children solve it and that's it. You learn something. I, I think um, games are a great a vessel for carrying stories and histories. Um, in the New Zealand educational context, uh, kids are developing pick-a-path story games that are telling stories about where they come from. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's powerful medium. And I think it goes way beyond just puzzles and just quizzes. What about you, Ahmed? Um, well, I thought about a lot of uh, uh, kinds of games that uh, don't involve any puzzles or, or puzzles. Okay. Uh, we have already some examples uh, mm -hmm. in, in the mainstream uh, gaming. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, teaching history uh, through uh, genres like uh, uh, adventure games or RPGs because a lot of them, they either uh, uh, present um, the, uh, let's say the right information, or sometimes uh, it's just uh, inspired by those history, historical moments. Um, and and uh, Assassin's Creed does a really good job. Uh, it's the series, series from uh, Ubisoft. And even the, the, uh, the latest uh, entry had uh, uh, had a sort of an, an education mode, not really an ed education mode. It's it's kind of like an exhibit mode, something like that. Oh, that's just, yeah, okay. uh, you can you can use that mode to just look at all the historical places that they have in the game, and and you oh. can also uh, learn more about those places. Okay, and, what else? <laughs> uh, let's see, I wrote them down in here. Um, uh, you could use, uh, let's say, uh, chemistry. You can teach mm -hmm. chemistry by um, having <laughs> uh, different uh, elements or chemical compounds to be your skill set. Okay, uh, for which games? <laughs> no, no, there's no example. This is just an idea in my head. <laughs> <laughs> It's the first can... game that gets cut in my mind. It's Witchers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, pretty much you can do that, um, and you, you can do many many sorts of things uh, to teach the player without just uh, um, throwing the uh, the large amount of information in in a matter of minutes. No, you could. I think it would depend on the game design. You could, I think, uh, people could learn from uh, from simple level designs in, in older games and how to cheat, teach some mechanics without telling the the player how to play. Using those kind of methods, I think, would uh, would be the best for uh, for educational games. Uh, for example, like uh, uh, tutorial levels in Call of Duty. They would just let you do all the shooting or all the ducking and every single mechanic before you go on. Or Super Mario Brothers with the first level, uh, without even telling you how to jump or move, you can figure out everything by yourself. Because so the, the, way the, the level the is designed. Yeah. Because you can teach them through level design. Okay. Dan, you have a point? I was going to say earlier in the year, we developed a game for um, an educational game where you were a salmonella bacteria and you had, and the, and the students had to navigate that, that bacteria through the large intestine and they met other bacteria along the way and we created different environments that mimicked the um, science and certain assessments. So I think you can provide a very contextualized learning experience in a game. And, and maybe in some cases, it's best not to even call it a game, but to call it a simulation. Um, That's actually a pretty good idea, the Salmonella game. <laughs> 
Yeah, at the end of this game, you you ultimately get flushed down the toilet. <laughs> it's the it's the it's it's the same ending every time. <laughs> so, uh, That's Leila, pretty cool. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ahmed. So, Leila, you have a point. Uh, yes, um, games teaches many uh, skills, not just by using puzzles. Uh, there are simulation games like. Uh, one of the uh, attendees have mentioned Rahman Haley in the chat. He said simulation games can be helpful. Yes, that's true. Uh, simulate uh, uh, flights, etc. They help understand or learn about things uh, without having to go through the actual experience and going through the actual danger uh, when making a mistake. Also, there is uh, we have uh, construction in games. Uh, we can construct stuff, and and this can teach. Uh, creativity can teach uh, patience can teach uh, how uh, to th to think how to build something like in Minecraft and similar game also uh, it can teach teamwork especially when there is multiplayers where you have to cooperate in order to win one for all and all for one this is an important skill when when working in a team and it, it's something we focus on when we teaching in university, there are certain uh, skills that we want to pass to the student. One of them is working in a team where they can discuss, uh, criticize, and cooperate in order to uh, get uh, the full mark for the project. That can be done in games. Uh, there are games that relies heavily on teamwork. And basically, without cooperating, they will not be able to win. Uh, there, is, there are also games that teaches physics, where they have to construct tools and vehicles. Like, uh, I remember my brother was playing uh, Little Big Planet, and uh, he was trying to construct a rocket, and he had to learn that he has to put a weight at the rocket's head so the, the rocket would go straight. It teaches physics when, when we want to build machines, etc., to be able to go to the next level. Also, it can teach uh, strategy and planning if you're playing with strategy games where you have to uh, spend fundings, where you have to think of how to uh, uh, move your army, how to plan, how you attack your enemy. This is also a, an important skill. There is also games that have economy in them where you have to buy and sell things and you have to think when is the best time to sell and when is the best time to uh, uh, buy. And, and lastly, uh, time management. There are games where you have a limit time to achieve something and you have to uh, do a, a, a set of tasks in order to achieve that thing. So we have to plan, for example, how you will spend the day in order at the end, at, at the night, at the game, uh, in the game time, you will be able to do uh, or you have achieved what you have plan to do so this is an important skill where we have to plan on what i'm going to do okay if i'm going to do this i will gain this if i'm going to do that i will lose uh, that other thing so i have to uh, prioritize the, t uh, the the things i have to do and uh, organize the time i have in game so games can teach a lot of things uh, more uh, uh, not just using puzzles and uh, uh, the usual means okay when you mentioned physics, uh, portal came into my head. Yeah, mm. that's right. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think this education games, we have fun when we play it. I mean, Minecraft, Little Big Planet, and a lot, a lot of games. Uh, but the younger generation, I think they will not love it or will not play it because they have Fortnite, PUBG, and Call of Duty, and a lot of games. So what the most element that I would add to my games to, to take the attention from the younger generation so they can play it? Like from the popular games, I will take some element or I take some idea and make it for new games to be an education game so the youngers or the kids can play with it. So can, can I hear the answer from you, Dan? Yeah, well, I think a lot of... Um today's kids they play a wide variety of games so i know that you know those are the some of the pop popular ones that you've mentioned um, but i also think um, 
a lot of learning can happen in those games. When those games are, uh, we, we, you know, when, when a teacher can sort of break areas and sort of create rooms in those games where they can sort of hang out with their students, a good educator can actually teach in those games. And one of, one of your, uh, I've heard teachers say to me, um, don't make us educational versions of your games because we can use the real ones more effectively um, because the, they're what engage our young people. So um, it's, it's how do to, how to teachers edu- uh, wield those games effectively in a learning context, I think is really important. And I think it's something teachers and educators need to be thinking about um, if they want to be engaging with the young people. Um, to your points around um, what, what, what other game developers can be doing or what, what games can be created, what parts of those games... Um, I would be looking towards what young people are doing in these games. Today's a lot of kids in Minecraft, they're actually crafting. So I think we're going to see lots of games in the future. They're going to be based on these mechanics that feature in the games that they're growing up in and playing. So um, providing them with, more opportunities to leverage those things that they already enjoy is really important. And I don't think it needs to be in a game like Fortnite or Minecraft. (laughs) We really just need to mimic those mechanics that are enjoyable and, um, and pay attention to what kids are playing. So I think they crafting also in Fortnite. I don't play this game, but I sound Mm -hmm. building some house or something. So, yeah. So, uh, the, the the similar point from to Minecraft and Fortnite is to create or create or to build, right? In Minecraft, I'd say yes. In Fortnite, it's probably more about. Not not like Minecraft. It's not the same, but they're still crafting. <laughs> well, yeah. in, in Minecraft, it's it's uh, the center of the game is is crafting. But yeah. uh, in, in Fortnite, it's not, uh, you could play the whole game without crafting. Okay. And yeah, it's just a, um, it's something that, that would support the gameplay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what's your point, Ahmed? Well, uh, I would, uh, Dan pretty much said uh, everything I wanted to say uh, is to, to find the mechanic or the thing that that's euphoric to uh, to the player, uh, whether it's crafting in Minecraft or the feel of of uh, let's say the, the shooting in 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 Call of Duty or the the way you build uh, quickly in in in, in, uh, in Fortnite, uh, whatever mechanic that that's that gives you this euphoric feeling should be implemented. In, in an educational game, so you can um, uh, so you can attract them, maybe give it some flair, uh, um, and, and most important, importantly, I would add, I will add this is the accessibility. You don't want to spend a lot of time teaching them how to play. You want them to learn how to play as they progress. You don't want to teach all the mechanics. You want to just teach them one simple mechanic now and then. 10 minutes later, another mechanic. Uh, hours later, another mechanic. It shouldn't be uh, in your face uh, right at the beginning. Um, that's that's what I think should be in educational games to make them attractive to younger people. Okay. What about you, Leila? What is the most element that we have to add it in the game? Well, basically, um, the, uh, the popular games are hard to compete with. And uh, if we want to make uh, the younger generation play a game we design, it's uh, basically we have to attract their parents more than we have to attract them. Uh, because the younger generation will play what is popular, what, what is being talked about. But sometimes the parents themselves try to 
uh, buy something for their kids. So we have to uh, put something that will attract the parents so they would think that this game is uh, beneficial to their uh, kids and they would buy it. Uh, but I, I don't think it's easy to attract um, the parents because in terms of game design, it's not about what you put in the game. It's about how popular your game is. Okay. So is there any interactive method that we can use it? Well, using uh, uh, expensive uh, licensed materials such, such as, as Disney characters. I mean, a lot of games that the parents buy to play with their kids is mostly uh, something like Disney games where they identify the characters. Okay, what about you, Dan? Yeah, well, if you look at a website like The Hour of Code, um, there's a lot of game-based activities in there um, that are uh, based on or around um, those properties that you were just talking about, like um, Star Wars and uh, Frozen. And so, yeah, I agree, kids are going to be attracted to those characters. And so that's about the, um, in a way, that's the business of games creation and games development and it's a something game creators and educators who collaborate need to be thinking about if we're making content for to engage and educate can we license those properties um, do we need to um, in some cases yes uh, in some cases maybe not so much I, yes Yeah, I, I was also thinking there are lots of games out there that um, F Fireboy and Watergirl um, is, a, is an interesting game that uh, kids just play because they enjoy playing it. And in that game, the hidden learning is um, physics, problem solving, and collaboration. And um, so... Uh, if, if we're talking about convincing... Are we talking about convincing parents that gaming is an efficient way to learn? Yes. No, yeah. no, we're we talking about the interactive method. But it's okay if you want to move to this point or you want to talk together about this point. It's okay. This is our next point because we will talk about it. Yeah. But now we are talking about interactive method that can be used in the game. So Layla talk about that they can use the character from Disney or by um, licenses to use it. Yeah, the, another interesting thing to think about there is that not all kids are going to have the same devices or um, technology. So in New Zealand, what we know is that most kids have a mobile phone. So when we're talking about educational games mm -hmm. at a policy level, we really want to be creating content that can work on a mobile phone because all kids have that technology whereas not all kids have a console especially in the classroom um, and then if you think about that a little bit more you can be um, trying to create content that um, they can be engaging with during the day but also after school in their own time as well and if we're creating content that kids want to interact with in an educational context, I think we're doing our job right okay. in their own time. Okay, so that is your, the best method that we we want to learn our... What, what's the device that means? Well, Where I want I to deliver my games in what consoles or what device? I've, I very much were... A, an educational hat when I think in, in this context. And so mm -hmm. in that, um, as opposed to my like game player consumer hat, my educator hat um, and thinking is very much around equity and equ learning equality. Um, and at least here, every more or less every kid has a mobile phone. So we're kind of, think for us, it's about creating gaming 
educational gaming content that can work on a mobile device, whether that's an iPhone or an Android phone, um, that doesn't really matter. Could be a Nintendo Switch. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Uh, what about your point, Ahmed? Uh, for me, the best tool is the is the is the simpler control method. Whether it's uh, just a, a touch on a phone or just a button on on a controller, the simpler the controls are, mm -hmm. the more accessible uh, the game is, yeah. and therefore uh, it'd be uh, much much uh, better for for the users, especially if they are children and they need uh, the parents to help them out how to use it. You don't want to uh, complicate things with the parents. And even even if there are no, you know, if, if they are not uh, really that young, and they can learn by themselves, uh, I think um, the more accessible your uh, product is, uh, the better. And we we saw that with uh, with smartphones, how how people started uh, downloading apps. And back then, apps were there in in, in older phones like Nokia and. and Sony Ericsson phones, but nobody did that because they weren't that accessible. So mm -hmm. when you make it accessible, people will start, uh, you know, using that product. Okay. So now we have our games, for example, on phone mobile. So of course, no, there's no free games. You download it as a free, but in the middle, you have to buy. Now, we want to convince the parents to buy this game or to play this game. It's good for their children or it's good for education or it's good for anything else. So how you convince the parents? We can start with you, Leila. Uh, convincing the parents that games are useful. Yes. Uh, well, basically, uh, the first thing you have uh, to do is to tell parents that games aren't just Call of Duty and Fortnite. There are uh, a variety of uh, games with different techniques and uh, different playing styles. And uh, you have to explain to them that uh, how each game uh, or uh, what are the best games for children. I remember lots of uh, people coming to ask me for, uh, about uh, games for their kids. I would give them examples like uh, Little Big Planet. I remember g telling them about Portal. It depends on the age of the child, but I I'm trying to give them games that are beneficial to the child. And and the the gameplay uh, has uh, it is well designed to the point that. The, these uh, people have to have, uh, or these children has to have a level of degree in order to pass the game. Uh, I remember one of my students, uh, he was um, so much against uh, playing games. And I remember he, him telling me that he doesn't allow his younger brothers and sisters to use uh, phones or play games. I remember I made him try harvest moon and i asked him what do you think about games and the thing he said i didn't know that there are these types of games he didn't know that such game exists he thought games about violence and that's it and this is what i think we have to spread awareness about games so this is the main thing we can start with okay thank you Leila. uh what about your dad from my perspective, um, our core business and activities center around kids developing games. And quite often we'll have parents um, dropping their kids off or picking their kids up um, from different workshops. And uh, when a parent sees what their kids have created, that's quite often a, a penny drop moment. Um, and it's just as exciting for the parents who probably played games themselves to see that their kids are um, developing games. And um, yeah, I, I think it's the million dollar question though. Um, <laughs> because I think every, every parent is going to have their different... Um, uh, sort of 
different motivators and they're not all going to see the world the same way. Uh, I think, but, but rest assured, we're, we're creating like a whole generation of young people who are growing up playing games. So as they become the parents, it's going to, this might not even be a question. <laughs> Okay, they'll thank all, you. They'll, they'll already be convinced. <laughs> okay, That's what thank I you. was about to say. Uh, it's that uh, we can try to uh, raise awareness, but uh, ultimately, uh, you know, newer generations will will know that that video games are not just violent video games. It could be anything, just like any other medium, like movies or or uh, uh, or TV shows, they could be about anything. So it's it's not uh, a genre specific uh, uh, industry, let's say. Okay, thank you, Ahmed. Um, okay, I have a point. A lot of popular games can provide some level of a skill, like reaction time, like shooter games, and fast decision making in some RPG games, and features planning and strategy like RTS games, or even high level of awareness, um, a level when it comes um, to platforms games, that the games can see the correct route to take it. The, game, the gamers can see the correct route to take it. So from all of you, I think, I believe that you are all gamers so what is the skill that you learn from non-education games so what we'll start with you dan <laughs> I, problem solving um is probably a big one um every time you start playing a new game uh, you have to learn the rules um and then you have to negotiate your way around the environment following those rules or adhering to those rules in order to complete the game that you're playing. So whether or not that's like based on reaction time or um, just solving puzzles, you, you still have to engage with that. And there's a term in the games industry called grokking. Um, and you have to, you know, you have to fully learn something to master it and to complete the game. So providing people, or I think good games are games that do that, where, they, where the player of the game has to constantly learn. Because every time you learn and solve a little bit of that, the puzzle in the game, you're actually providing like a cognitive hit. You're, you're providing an experience that... Um, feels good and i think good games engage their players by taking advantage of that and providing a feel-good experience and, and that can be found in all of those things you mentioned when i was a kid playing i played street fighter 2 i don't know how if anyone has heard of that but that was very much a um, reaction-based game. And I got a great deal of pleasure playing that. And my reaction times would have been pretty good, but I wasn't learning anything else. Um, so you need a large variety of games to um, satiate a whole universe of different subject matter. Yes. Um Okay, thank you for your point, Dad. Uh, Ahmed, I believe you yes. play a lot of games. Yeah. So, what skill you did, you, did you learn from non-education games? Oh, uh, <laughs> mostly uh, problem solving, and and that has you know many different kinds of problem solving. Uh, games in general, uh, it's either uh, uh, an experience. Uh, let's say a story experience or something, or problem solving. You're problem solving all the time. Uh, and uh, also, I learned how to uh, I learned how to read uh, more quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. 
I'm reading much, much faster, uh, especially in English, uh, even though my native tongue is Arabic. Uh, but when it comes to reading, especially silent reading, I can easily do that in English. It's much, much faster than in Arabic. And that's due to uh, uh, the RPGs that I used to play on like Super Nintendo and PlayStation 1 because they were all text-based. And uh, yeah, uh, so problem solving and, and maybe, uh, let's say, uh, language. Yes. Thank you, Ahmed. Leila? Uh, I do agree with Ahmed that English is something I've learned just because I want to uh, understand what's going on so I know what is the next, next task in game in game to do in order to uh, finish the game. And Street Fighter 2 is my first Street Fighter ever. <laughs> in my case, you, you might find it strange, but I didn't play much on console, even though I've, I've had uh, uh, Sega, I, I, I had Super Nintendo, etc. But mostly I was playing on PC. And what I've learned is how to troubleshoot. Because most of the time, back then, games weren't plug and play. You had to do a, a lot of setup in order for the game to uh, run correctly, especially when it comes to running the audio and voice acting, etc. So th this is one of the main uh, skills I have learned. In order to make the game work on PC, I had to do a lot of reading in order to understand how to set up the game correctly. So troubleshooting and concluding a critical thinking, solve, uh, problem solving, language, and uh, fast reaction. Oh, yeah. I, I have yeah. some points also. I learn. I learned from the planning and like for future planning. For example, um, the new games, uh, Heavy Rain and Detroit. That's game, so. But sometime when I choose something, I hope in the real life, I can see if that person will remember when I do this or he angry or blah, blah, blah. But it's helped me how to think and how to planning for the future. So uh, we have, uh, before we end, okay, we have some question. I didn't know if you see the question of the guys, they wrote it for us. Did you see it? Yeah. I, yes. Okay. I so uh, I just wanted to answer for these people. First, Saad Al Ghamdi. Saeed Al Ghamdi. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did you think that such a game? will need my uh, many scenarios and if this the case what will be the best approach to build up uh, such a games um, if you can clarify uh, it says do you think such games uh, what do you mean which games because I think he was asking that uh, while we we're talking about certain games but no, um, we don't know which ones. Okay, um, so do you, you didn't have any answer? Uh, education games, you see. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. Um, in education games, we have it in order to um. Uh, to give uh, the best uh, form of education, we have to include many scenarios. For example, what happened if we did this combination or what happened if we did this action before that? Uh, uh, doing such games isn't hard. It's just that um, uh, we have uh, similar games, like we have visual novel story where the player can get different ending by uh, selecting different uh, actions. So it's not uh, that hard to create. And uh, we have games that have many scenarios already. Okay. Okay. Um, also, we have here questions. Ah, uh, Dan, you also you already answered, but I think uh, 
we will answer to all, okay? Any advice on how to make uh, educational games for fun? Because I believe it's hard. Yeah, so I, I was saying that game development is hard. So it's important for people who want to make games that haven't made games before to collaborate and find people who have made games and do it with them. I think one issue I've sort of seen over the years is educators will create games without having ever made games before. And then they're surprised that their students don't enjoy those games. But, but similarly, I've seen game developers try and create games about educational subjects that they don't hit the, the learning outcomes properly either. So I think game development inherently is a partnership and whenever we're making a game as a studio, we have to work with others. We have to learn those subjects. Um, so yeah, my, my advice on that is to team up and find the right people to de de develop with. Okay, thank you, Dan. And how, here we also have a question from Maha Amir. Maha Amir. Uh, I have a question I have find answer if you would have a create a project which was about a VR technology in a place of a school. Okay, mm. can you go to the journey through the VR with some assessment prepared before the after virtual journey? So the question is what kind of advice you may give me to the subject? I would be asking you why the assessment has to come before or after, why can't that be wrapped into the gameplay experience itself? I think that's a more, and then if you want the evidence of their learning, then the, um, their interactions throughout the game and how they've completed the game or won the game, you, you need to be thinking about how you can record that and assess that. It's okay. You have uh, answer, Leila? Um, well, uh, basically, when you're creating a VR game, uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the technical stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about how to make the journey as comfortable as possible. Uh, try to make sure that the game or the, the VR experience doesn't uh, cause any kind of sickness or problems uh, during uh, the, the VR journey. Uh, I, rem I remember I've, I've, um, I hated uh, using VR in my game because every time I do testing, it causes me a lot of uh, issues. So when you're designing the, the journey, try to, to, to uh, use methods that reduce uh, sickness in order to uh, produce a very uh, comfortable experience. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and here, um, thank you, Leila. Thank you, Dan, for answering. Uh, here, we, here we have a question from Saad al Hamayid. Uh, how can the VR help to improve the quality of education in games? So, Ahmed, can I hear it from you, the answer? Uh, if the VR can help to improve, okay. Uh, it's... Not necessarily help uh, to, to, to improve the quality of educational games. Maybe in, in certain genres like uh, simulation or, um, or some sort of uh, a touring experience. Uh, I think VR improves those kind of games. Uh, I don't think it will improve uh, something that doesn't need the person to be in a space, in a virtual space. Um, yeah, so pretty much, I think, uh, uh, I think by having the right genre, it would improve the educational game. If, uh, for example, you have uh, uh, what you call it. Uh, there's uh, uh, there's a, 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 a touring experience for let's say. Uh, uh, Mecca, uh, it was yeah. done by Sima 4. Uh, this is, you can improve that by 
putting VR in it because this is a, like a, a touring uh, experience. Uh, that would be great with VR. If you, get, if you want to show something, if you want to uh, show a, a certain environment or space or, uh, or, or monuments or whatever, any historical uh, uh, spaces, I guess. Okay. Thank you, Ahmed. Dan, you have uh, any point, question, or answer for the question? I think um, I've heard people talking about VR being used um, to help people empathize with other scenarios and situations and, and people as well. Um, I, but ultimately, I think it comes down to the quality of the, um, the game and whether it, um, you know, does a better job or not in terms of teaching the specific learning outcome in question. Um, I think we'll, we'll see. I think VR is still, it's pretty early days. Thank you, Dan. Um, here also we have a question from Abdurrahman Rahili. Uh, he said, how uh, to maintain such a study curve in learning game development? No, curve, I think. Curve? Yes, yeah. curve. Yes, curve. Yeah. Uh, did you see the question? I, all, you, all of you can see the yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would like to answer that. Um, okay, Leila. Uh, I teach game development, and uh, part of what I teach is game design. And uh, basically... There is a uh, one topic uh, where we talk about the type of challenges in games. There are the physical uh, challenges that relies heavily on eye-hand coordination. There are the formal logic where we rely on logic alone. There is uh, 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 another type of logic where we use our knowledge about the game and uh, logic in order to solve puzzles. Uh, so basically, uh, for each type of challenges, there are ways to increase the difficulty and to dec decrease the difficulty. For example, in physical challenges where uh, the player uh, has to uh, have a very high eye-hand coordination, uh, we have to introduce different kind of uh, challenges. For example, avoiding bullets while uh, killing enemies and, and, and avoiding obstacles. So here, how do we increase and decrease the difficulty? It's by, for example, increasing the number of enemies and uh, or decreasing the number of enemies. So we can start uh, with a basic level and then we increase it little by little until we, we reach the desired level. And uh, we need to test that. We need to show the case, the, the game in uh, as many events as possible to get feedback from uh, the players in order to understand or to um, know if our game is at a reasonable difficulty level or not. I remember uh, we were showcasing out of coverage uh, and we noticed that people found it hard to uh, solve uh, or escape the first room. So uh, we added uh, one line to, as a hint to, to tell them how to solve the puzzle. So it's a trial and error thing, basically. Thank you, Leila. Uh, do you have any point, Dan or Ahmed? Okay, so we will go to the next question from Samir uh, Khayyat. Uh, who are the industry leader in education games? No answers? Uh, I would love to know. <laughs> I think IBM. I remember hearing that they are um, developing serious games, right? Um, I don't have any questions, uh, answers. 
I remember hearing that they are developing games where they are used for action, actual training, uh, not uh, just for regular uh, educational stuff. But uh, I, I'm not sure uh, about that. But if I'm asked that question, I would say IBM. OK. I don't know, actually, who's that. <laughs> Do you have any answers, Dad? I think um, there's a company in America called A-Line Media who developed a game called Never Alone. Mm -hmm. And they developed Never Alone in partnership with the um, Inupia people in Alaska. And, you know, I think that their games are pretty cool. And, um, you know, authentic and uh, the... In that particular game, Never Alone, it was the first sort of learning game where you're learning about a culture that I really noticed and lots of other people around the world really noticed. And um, yeah, but, but otherwise I think Minecraft is also, um, you know, a leader in that space. Um, and I would say that based on the number of kids that are engaging with Minecraft, I think that evidence there is in the numbers um, and of course our own product game fruit i have to have to um throw that in there um as well okay uh thank you dan uh also now we have the last question from also abdurrahman uh do you think that we are that we are as a society is ready to engage a games in the learning process then I believe you are ready also. <laughs> You're ready. Yeah, well, I, th I think some of us are already doing it. And um, it's one of those learn through doing type things. Um, I, I think as a society, I think we're getting closer and closer. Uh, what I can say is that there are more educators uh, in New Zealand at least, that are willing to try games-based learning out. And I think it comes from a position of caring about their students and wanting to, really wanting at a deep level to engage their students and provide them the best possible learning experience. And if games are the mechanism for that, then I think that'll happen. If, it's, if games are truly the right mechanism for that, then that will just happen because everybody wants the best learning experience possible for their kids. Um, and we just tackle it one educator at a time. I think it's really important for other people listening to this to find ways to engage teachers that might not be using games in their classrooms now, find ways to engage with them and to introduce games to them in a way that they can use it in their classroom. Because if they can't see how they can use games and gaming technology in their classroom, if it doesn't align with their pedagogy or the learning outcomes or the curriculum, then you might have trouble convincing those teachers that um, it's games are the right tool for the job. So we've got to be, as an industry, strategic. We've got to be deliberate in what we do and what we say and what we talk about. I think we're getting there. Okay. Uh, Ahmed and Layla, we are in the same society. So what do you think? Thank you, Dan. I think uh, our society is ready, even though we're getting all the, uh, uh, all the conspiracy theories about how bad video games are. Uh, and people tend to get suicidal and all those things. Um, uh, with that, I think our society is ready. Uh, we just need to uh, we need to reach them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Leila. Yes, I do agree with Ahmed. Everyone or almost everyone has a mobile phone, uh, and there are consoles, and almost all the uh, or lots of people have consoles. So yeah, we're ready to have uh, educational games. Uh, just that the educators need to think about that. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Dan and Ahmed and Leila for answering these questions. And uh, before we end this meetings, uh, do you have any advices you want to share it? We will start with you, Dan. Um, don't underestimate the the power of, of games um, as a learning tool. Um, and, it, and, and I would just sort of... Um, like to point out again, it doesn't have to be an educational game. Uh, any game, like it's, in fact, I think it's probably better if we're, we're choosing the games that kids engage with already. Um, and think about how we can use those games in an educational context. Um, it's too expensive. We'll never be able to compete with Minecraft. We'll never be able to compete with Fortnite. So we can't create games that are exactly like that. So how do we use them? Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, Ahmed, do you have any yes. advices you want to share it? Okay. Uh, uh, in addition to what Dan said, because uh, I agree with him as well, um, uh, I think uh, I think the focus should be on instead of uh, trying to present just present the educational parts and then uh, trying to slightly gamify it. Uh, I think you should stay away from that. Uh, try to create a game. You're creating a game, and then. Have your uh, have the educational uh, elements as resources, uh, and you know I have some other points as well. Uh, have it uh, have a better interactivity or better hands-on with the game. Uh, have uh, some good feel controls, uh, something that is very satisfying. It's not easy to do, but uh, that's what all the other games are aiming to do. So I think uh, you should have the same, kind of the same goals, but with the educational elements, um, try to have it more attractive. Uh, and, and I don't agree with people who say that, okay, education is not attractive. No, it is. It's just how you present it. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, lots of people are searching uh, <laughs> for uh, God for uh, lore with you know all those mythologies and all those things, and they want to learn more about uh, the the places that are there. Uh, it's because they had an engaging game, and it's a lot of fun, and makes them want to know more about the space. Um, also, you, you got to have better uh, sense of purpose. Uh, why games are much more attractive and fun to play is because uh, you know you have. Uh, a fun purpose or, or goal to to reach for, and uh, and 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 lastly, the most important part is to make it as accessible as possible. Thank you, Ahmed. Leila, do you have any advices you want to share? It well, um, I'm going to talk as, as someone in the education field. Uh, it just that you have to keep your mind open and try to look for uh, different ways to to help the student understand the concept you're trying to teach them. Uh, don't make information abstract. No, give it context. Try to make it fun. Uh, try to look for new methods uh, to teach whatever you're teaching. Uh, don't stick to old school method. Explore new ways in teaching. This is what I want to say. Mm. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Dan. Thank, thank you, Leila. You thank you for, uh, for your time. And also thanks for our listening. Uh, I hope you enjoy it and learn from, from it. Uh, thank you all. And uh, see you again, inshallah. Thank you, thank Ina. You. Good night. <laughs> Bye. Good morning, Dan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Dan. <laughs> see you all. I'll see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.